Hi everyone, welcome to my semi talk. It feels strange after doing these for so many false times in a row to be sitting at my house by myself trying to do this. Excuse any uh, misspeakings, I had my wisdom tooth out yesterday, so I think it's a little bit ropey. And uh, excuse any mess in the background, as this is my lovely home office in Edinburgh, in Scotland. Well, thank you for joining me today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about homebrew, as usual, and the macOS Big Sur and ARM, also known as Apple Silicon, and how homebrew has adapted to support both of these. Now, through this talk, I'll be using ARM mostly when referring to Apple Silicon, even though that's not what Apple calls it. This is just because it's a bit simpler for me and it fits more easily on the slides. So those of you who haven't come across me before, nice to meet you. My name is Mike McQuaid. Here's some of the ways you can kind of contact me. Um, I'm on GitHub and my uh, username on GitHub, on GitHub and on Twitter is the same, Mike McQuaid, just the same as my name. I'm an employee at GitHub as well. I've been there about seven years. I'm a staff engineer working on communities. So feel free to get in touch with me after this talk, if you have any questions about Homebrew or GitHub, or you want to discuss anything in particular. But let's get on with things. Right, so Mac OS Big Sur is the first version of Mac OS uh, that has adopted a new versioning model since OS X was originally released a long time ago. And this is interesting for us for a few reasons because we've had to deal with various ups and downs through the betas so in the first beta we had mac os 10.16 big sur which was the version that we saw being used so 10.15 was the previous version that we were supporting known as mojave and this looked kind of like it was all going to be fairly normal but then stuff started showing up in some of the betas with mac os 11 and then in the initial ones, it seemed to be a difference between 16 in some places and 11 in other places. And this was differentiated by 10.16 for the Intel betas and 11 for the ARM or Apple Silicon betas. And this obviously was fun in itself because you have two different versions that refer to the same thing from our perspective. And also with the 11, it's been 10 point whatever for I think 12 years at this point uh, maybe a bit longer actually I think maybe 15 or 16 I can't tell off the top of my head and yeah there's a lot of regexes out there that assume a mac os version is going to be 10 point something so I immediately saw this and thought uh oh this is going to break a ton of regexes but where it gets even more fun is we're now on mac os 11.1 big sur so Previously, you had 10.16, 0.1, 0.2, 0 0.3, whatever would be the way they would have done their releases. And that meant that we could kind of track the different versions and the major minor versioning was kind of consistent. And we thought, okay, well, if they move to this 11 model, then it will, it will effectively be just the same as before, but they will shift things slightly. And instead, what they've done is Apple have decided to have different SDKs per minor version of the OS. So whereas previously they would have just had a 10.15 SDK and a 10.16 SDK, now they have an 11.0 SDK and 11.1 SDK. So again, this is solvable stuff, but there's a huge amount of assumptions in Homebrew and various build scripts that things are not going to work this way. And Homebrew ends up acting as a bit of a kind of glue layer for a lot of projects. So we abstract away and fix in the build system some of the things where people pass, you know, SDKs that are no longer around, selecting the right SDK based on the OS, based on the compiler you're using, all this type of stuff. So this causes a bit of fun and hiccups, and we're still slightly figuring this out but i think we've got to a point now where we're pretty stable and we have something which works reliably going forwards so the next big change that we saw was the arrival of apple silicon which i'm referring to as arm throughout this so apple announced that a few people had sort of suspected this was coming for a while but their own custom in-house 
architecture that they were going to use that they had built for new Macs. So the interesting thing with this, sorry, give me one sec. The interesting thing with this was that it was going to require us to fix a bunch of homebrew code to no longer make assumptions about what platform things are running on. So uh, I'm sorry, but by platform there, I mean architecture. So for a while, Homebrew has been Intel x86 only, but this hasn't always been the case. Um, so on Mac OS X, when it originally was released for the first versions, they were all running on PPC32 processors. And I believe then there was PPC32 and 64. So that's the PowerPC architecture that Apple used to use. I believe some folks out there are still kind of running PowerPC chips, but you certainly don't see as much of them nowadays as you used to. And when Apple was shipping these two versions at once, they used what they called their, I guess, universal support, where they would ship fat binaries, their words, not mine, um, basically binaries where they've been built for each architecture and they've been kind of glued together with a tool called LiPo. Um, again, it feels like a, a pun intended there. And those uh, architectures are glued together in a single executable, say, or library. So when you run the executable, it will select based on the architecture that is uh, what your current CPU is in your machine. So then after that, uh, Apple made the migration from PPC to Intel chips. They had previously made a move from a different Motorola architecture in the past to the PPC. So Apple at this point are, have made a few architecture jumps over the years. So their way of handling this, which I'll touch upon later on as well, was to have a thing called Rosetta, which let, if you had an x86 laptop, you could still run some of the PPC code because it's a completely different architecture. It's not backwards compatible in any sort of meaningful way. So they, again, provided these fat binaries with x86 as well. And this was about the sort of time where I had first started using a Mac. I first started using a Mac in... I think it was 2008 or nine or something um, and Max were x86 and when I got involved with homebrew Apple was just starting to explore x86 64 with Mac OS 10.6 Snow Leopard uh, where they were providing 64-bit support for the first time there was a bit of 64-bit support in Leopard 10.5 but that was kind of minimal enough and it was you had to kind of use a few kind of hacks to get working so not many people were distributing stuff there so this was homebrew uh, supported both leopard and snow leopard so we had to start dealing with kind of multiple architectures at this point and in the early homebrew days as well uh, we were a lot more of a compiling from source package manager we had extensive options we had no ci and a much, much smaller number of users who didn't really expect things to work all at the time. So we provided a lot of customizability for people to be able to select for some software to be able to build, say, all four of these architectures at once. But then pretty soon, Apple were getting to the point where they were dropping their PPC stuff. They didn't support Rosetta anymore. I forget what version they dropped that on. And they were supporting just x86 and x86-64. And then before you know it, we're just down to x86-64. So this has been probably a pretty long time for homebrew that there's been no Macs that we, or at least no Mac versions that we support uh, that have any support for x86 and, um, or at least have no, at least all of these Macs can run x86 64 code. So we've been steadily sort of um, focusing on shipping Mac OS for a single architecture, but I think we always suspected something like this could happen in future. And also, not wanting to deliberately tear out a bunch of the code before. So we did tear out the code to build multiple architectures, that universal support that we talked about, but we always kept around code, letting Homebrew be multiple architecture friendly because although we don't support it, we have some people who run Homebrew on Raspberry Pis and on PPC chips and stuff like that still. So we, so we thought we'd keep that around. And that's obviously proved useful to us now that we now have ARM64, aka ARM, aka Apple Silicon, which is where we are today. So we are now having to support Homebrew on two architectures. We're shipping binaries for two architectures. Uh, this is probably, the, this is in fact, yeah, it is the first time that we have had CI for multiple architectures 
both running the same OS and building the same thing in different configurations in different places. So that's been sort of interesting and it will be interesting to see how that kind of challenge goes on in future. So I mentioned in the past, there was Rosetta, which was, I guess, a reference to the Rosetta Stone. Um, and that allowed you to run PPC code on x86. So nowadays we have, with the new ARM Apple Silicon Max, we have what Apple call Rosetta 2, which is what lets you run x86-64 code. I don't believe x86 code, but I could be wrong there. Um, and it lets you run that on ARM. So the benefits of that is you still have a certain amount of backwards compatibility of those programs that haven't been ported yet. Um, and unlike in the old days with Rosetta, Homebrew sort of just pretended that didn't exist. Whereas now we've actually doubled down a little bit more and we're trying to work around Rosetta 2 to provide a nicer user experience for our users. So if you've been using Homebrew on Mac, particularly for a little while, you've known that we've used user local for a long time as a default installation location. So the reasoning for this is because it lets you pick stuff up in your compiler paths automatically. It didn't used to be used for anything, although more and more stuff dumps things in there. Um, and it basically just was a nice, easy location that we could use. So we've used that for a long time. We've we've had sort of sporadic backlash about that, some of which is valid, saying, well, this location is used by other uh, tools, so we can maybe avoid it, and some of it is invalid with asking people, people getting very upset about changing the permissions and suggesting that you install it in home instead, because in my opinion, that is an invalid uh, viewpoint to be concerned about, because if you're concerned about your package manager being human readable and someone getting access to be able to run arbitrary code in your machine, then you probably care about the fact that they can destroy or edit or modify all your documents and such like anyway. But anyway, moving on. So Humbro on Linux has a slightly different default location. And the, these default locations are not only where the installer will install things for you, but these are where the majority of the binary packages work. Some binary packages we have are what we call relocatable. So that means you can install them in a homebrew installation anywhere and we can just modify the references in there and they can work anywhere. But a non-relocatable non binary package, bottles we call them, mean that unfortunately you have to use the specific supported location. So user local or on Linux, home Linux brew, Linux brew. Well, I'll explain why in a minute. You have to use that location if you want to get the binary packages. And as we are mainly a binary package manager nowadays, that's what we strongly recommend and that's arguably all we support. So if you install in a different location and that works for you, then great. If you install in a different location, you have problems with builds and such like, then we're unlikely to fix your problems, unfortunately. So the Linux location, the reasoning for that is because um, Homebrew on Linux has quite a lot of users, maybe the, the majority of the original sort of users but back when it was called Linux Brew, we're on sort of scientific computing environments where they may well have a bunch of stuff on big scientific computing clusters and they have access to a home directory on their machine, but they can't use the native package manager. So Linux Brew was useful to be able to install bits and pieces on those machines. And a few of those folks found that it was relatively easy to ask your sysadmins for those machines because you normally don't have root on them if you're a scientist working on them. And if you get access to those machines to be able to create a new user called Linux Brew, and then you can get right access to their home directory, then you can use this default installation location, which can be shared between multiple users on the same machine without needing root access for any of them and have binary packages that can work in this location. So I mentioned before the stuff with Rosetta 2 and about how we're trying to support that a little bit better than we did before. So as part of that, because there's this transparent x86 compatibility layer and because of our packages being installed in user local and not being relocatable outside of that, we wanted to have a way to allow people until Homebrew on ARM is significantly more established and until binary packages are fully supported for everything. We wanted to have a way for people to kind of have a fallback that would still work nicely for them, which didn't involve building from source. So. Homebrew on ARM has a new default installation, default installation location, which is opt homebrew. So again, that looks a little bit like Mac ports. We can tip our hat to them and say thank you for the inspiration there. And this 
is a new location that we're we're using. Everything will be all encapsulated there. It's pretty obvious that everything in there will just be homebrew. And there is where the binaries on ARM are going to be built for. And we have now some minor restrictions on installation locations, which we didn't have before. So if you try and install under ARM into user local or try and install Intel under Opt Homebrew, we now won't let you. And the reason for that is we want to provide the support to effectively use, if you're on an ARM Mac now, the M1 chips, I think they call them, um, then in user local, we want to reserve that for a Rosetta 2 installation of Homebrew. So that means you can have an installation in user local and an installation in Opt Homebrew, and the two of them will play nice with each other. They will use the correct binary packages and they won't get confused and start trying to link against the other one. So now we've got to a point where that allows people we have about a third, I think, of the usage from analytics data so far for this Rosetta 2. Still, the most people on ARM Macs are still just using this completely um, native location, and they're finding that that works pretty well for them. I'll talk about what the breakdown is shortly. But if not, you can use user local. And there's some people, it seems, who just use that for everything because they don't want to deal with the hassle. So obviously, there'll be a slight performance benefit. Well, it depends on the, the software you're running, but for um, natively compiled software, there will be some degree of performance benefit for running the natively compiled ARM binaries. So that's beneficial and we, we would like to sort of recommend that, but then the user local Rosetta 2 is a good fallback as well. So bottles, these binary packages I mentioned, so a bottle block for one of our packages looks a little bit like something like this. So you can see now this is basically all the supported versions we have now. There are some versions where we try, if the package isn't upgraded and we release a new version of macOS, we try and just add the new binary package rather than removing any old ones. So this is a tool that has all the supported versions of Homebrew on macOS right now. So we've got Big Sur, ARM64 Big Sur, Catalina Mojave, High Sierra, Sierra, El Capitan, Yosemite, and Mavericks, going all the way back. So. The ARM binary packages are just handled like any others. We've got this ARM64 Big Sur. We'll probably continue that sort of naming format until we have, at some point in the future, we'll have a macOS version where they don't support Intel anymore. That seems fairly inevitable based on the way they've dealt with migrations in the past. So until then, we're just going to continue adding and trying to build these packages. So how's that effort going for ARM? Well, as I mentioned before, not everything is available yet for ARM. Uh, we've got our ARM CI, which is a nice kind of collaboration between three companies that have helped us out here. So GitHub Actions, we've now replaced all our Jenkins installation that was our cause of security vulnerabilities for us in the past. And just generally, we didn't have the decent amount of admin staff to be able to actually keep that up and running well. So we're using GitHub Actions for most of our CI. And then for actually building the binaries themselves, we've got our own workers in Mac Stadium. So Mac Stadium have generously provided us with um, various VMs for our Macs in the past. So that's where we've been running our um, Intel workloads for a few years. And then now Apple have supplied us with some DTKs. That's, um, I forgot what that stands for, but basically they're ARM kind of developer kits. Um, and hopefully in future ones, those have to be returned to Apple. We'll be able to get some Mac minis or similar off them as well so that we can run this um, ARM CI. So if you go and submit a homebrew package or change to the homebrew core repository now, it will now be running GitHub Actions uh, on a Apple DDK hosted by Mac Stadium to build ARM binary packages the same way we do with Intel ones. So we've got at the moment, we've got at my time of checking last at least uh, 4,615 Intel Big Sur bottles. So that's essentially all the packages that need binary packages and are working on Big Sur for Intel, which is you know pretty much everything. And then we have 3,850 for ARM slash Apple Silicon. So we're, we're not fully there, and there's obviously gonna be stuff that's missed, but for a good number of people, it does seem that they're um, able to install everything they wanted to install and get that all working on ARM without the need to kind of fall back on the Intel stuff. So this has actually gone a lot quicker than I expected. And it's been, I'd like to give a particular shout out to FX Kuder, who is one of our maintainers who's been doing a lot of work on this, um, and particularly on the kind of packaging side and bottling side, getting this all up and running. So great work to everyone who's taken part in that and all the other home maintainers who've kind of chipped in on the arm work as well. So if you're wondering which of those 
bottles apply to you or not and you want it to kind of check maybe before you buy it on Mac or before you're sort of making sort of decisions around this stuff, then you can go onto formulae.brew.sh. That's our, our main website now for hosting the stuff. And as of today, um, Eric has just added one of our other maintainers, like nicely formatted stuff, providing the detail of what the support is. So you can see for OpenSSL 1.1, we provide binary packages for Big Sur, Catalina, and Mojave on Intel and Big Sur for Apple Silicon. And that details basically that, okay, we have a binary package there. That means the package will work or at least should work um, to the, and we will support that to the same extent as Intel. So we will treat things not working there not compiling as, uh, well, sorry, not, not compiling, things not working with the binary package. We'll treat that as a bug and we will try and endeavor to fix them in the same way as we would for Intel. So from that perspective, I can announce today that Homebrew on ARM slash Apple Silicon is officially supported. If you submit issues, we will prioritize them the same way as we would do with Intel ones. Um, obviously, we have limited amounts of maintainers who have ARM hardware, so it may not be quite as easy for us to fix these, but we will still endeavor to do so. And this also brings us along to the fact that we're calling this Homebrew 3.00. So... This has been a pretty big deal, getting all the ARM support working, and it feels like a major milestone for Homebrew that we've been able to do so relatively quickly and announce official support. So I'm happy to announce Homebrew 3.0. And now, hopefully you've enjoyed watching this video, and I should be, assuming that uh, my children are not interfering with my life too much, I should be in the Matrix chat now, and I can answer any questions. So thanks for joining me. Goodbye.